one of the most important steps in the scientific method is to make observation. And in chemistry and in science in general, we do have two different types of observations that we can make. We can make qualitative observations, which are basically just word description of your phenomenon. So for example, you might say the book is heavy or the sky is blue or the room is large, etc. Or you can make quantitative observation. And another word for quantitative observation is a measurement. What it is is to make the same observation, but then by comparing that phenomenon to some type of a standard. So for example, we would say the book, instead of just heavy, we would say it weighs 5.2 pounds. So we're comparing it to a standard, the standard in this case being a pound. So that's what a quantitative observation or measurement is. Now, of course, when we measure things, as you saw in these two examples, we need a unit and we also need a number. So when I say we're comparing it to a standard, that's what a unit is. The unit is some type of standard that everybody agrees on. There are several different unit systems that you might have already learned in prior science classes. The British or the imperial system is what we use still every day in the United States. Those are things like feet, inches, miles, acre, and so on. The, the reason that these units are a little harder to use is because the conversions from one unit to another unit is not always consistent. So for example, in between the foot and the inch, there is a one to 12 conversion. And then with the pines and the quartz, there's a one to two and the gallon and a pine is one to eight and so on. So there's a lot of different numbers that are being used to convert one unit of measurement and the other one. There's no consistent way to convert from one unit to the other. So then comes in the metric system, which is the unit system that is used by everybody in the world with the exception of the United States and a couple other countries. You still need to convert between one unit and another, except that the conversion here is all powers of 10. Could be multiplying by 10, could be multiplying by a hundred, a thousand, a million, etc. Or alternatively, if you're going to smaller, smaller sizes, you would divide by factors of 10. So you might divide by 10, by a hundred, by a thousand, by 10,000, etc. The way we convert from smaller to larger units is by using these prefixes in the metric system. So we always have what we call the base unit. The base unit is associated with that property. So for example, for length, our base unit is meter. So if you attach one of these prefix to your base unit, then it automatically means either to multiply or to divide by some factor of 10. So for example, if you add the prefix kilo, which is a letter K to meter, that means multiply the meter a thousand times. So it's like arranging a thousand meters side by side until you reach that one kilometer unit. Or if you put the uh, prefix milli next to the meter, that means to divide the meter into a thousand pieces. And so each of the little piece is the millimeter unit. And again, you can do this with any other properties you want. So mass, for example, the base unit is gram. So if I attach a kilo next to it, again, that means the same thing. That means that that gram unit is being multiplied a thousand times. All right. Now, what about this SI system? So SI stands for System International, and it's basically the same as the metric system. It's just a specific type of unit system that is based on the metric system that's used in scientific measurements. So a lot of times we would say, what's the SI unit? And we're referring to basically what is the specific metric unit that is being used for that property. So for mass, we would use kilogram as the SI unit. But again, kilogram is a metric based unit. It's really important to have the right units. There's actually an example of a disastrous mistake in units. So this was the Mars Climate Orbiter that was designed by a computer that has one unit system but then when it was trying to land in Mars, it was controlled by another computer with a different unit system. As a result, the order that was given to this shuttle was incorrect. And then the orbiter actually went into the atmosphere way further down than it needed to. And so as a result, actually end up uh, either colliding or burning away. And that's obviously a multi-million dollar mistake. And so I really want to emphasize how important it is to have units when you're writing uh, answers or understand what the size of the units are. Okay, matter when we study in chemistry can be very, very tiny, like the size of atoms, or it could be really, really large, like the size of stars. So it's really useful if we can simplify the writing of these really small and really large numbers. And we do it two different ways, right? We use something called scientific notation, uh, as well as the metric prefixes that I just mentioned to you earlier. For example, let's say I have a number
number that's this size, right? 1 billion 230 million meters. It's really inconvenient to have to write it out that way. So we can write it with a scientific notation, which would look something like this, or we can find the closest metric prefix that would make this a much easier number to write. So since I have a billion, so if I go there and I try to find 10 to the 9, my closest metric prefix to 10 to the 9 is giga. So then I would say that number is the same as 1.23 giga meter. Okay, let's say you have this number right here. This is so hard to read because there's so many zeros, I have to count it. So then another way to do this is to write it as a scientific notation, which looks something like this, or we can find the closest metric prefix to 10 to the minus 10. It's either 10 to the minus 9 or 10 to the minus 12, and I could do it either way. Um, so if I want to write it as 10 to the minus 9, which is nano, instead of 3.6 nanoliter, it will become 0.36 nanoliter. Or if it's written in terms of pico, then it would be 360 picoliter. Now I'm not going too much uh, depth into how these conversions are done because this is really a review of a prior chemistry class. Okay, we just talked about the unit component of a measurement. Now we're going to talk about the value. How do we get the values that we get when we measure something? When we say something is 5.2 pounds, well, where is that 5.2 come from? Uh, or where is the 3200 in the 3200 square feet come from? Uh, they come from an instrument. You have to have a device that is specifically designed to measure that property, whether that property is length or mass or weight or volume or whatever. When you have a device that's being used to measure something like some of the examples shown here, they're not going to be able to read unlimited number of digits. So this is what we refer to as the precision of the instrument. So the precision is just how many digits we can actually read from the instrument. Okay, like here, both of these are what we call speedometer. In this one right here, we see a two digit number 74 miles per hour. In this one right here, we can see a little bit more, we might say 74.5 miles per hour. And so that one has more digits compared to this one. So we would say that that one would be more precise. Same thing with scales. Some scales give you four digits like this one. Some scales gives you only three digits. Okay. So the number of meaningful digits that you can write down tells other people how confident you are in your measurement. If you're very confident about something, that means you are very certain about it. So there's very little uncertainty. So let me show you an example here in terms of what this actually means. So let's say you're measuring the length of an object and the length of that object is 0.428 meter. What that means is if I'm making this measurement a thousand times, okay or a million times right that as I'm making that measurement the number will change sometimes it's 0.428 sometimes it's 0.427 sometimes it's 0.429 that's sort of the standard way we interpret the meaning of a measurement we say that it's plus minus basically whatever the last digit is we're gonna add and subtract one from that last digit that's written there okay the smallest digit that's written there so it's the measurement is this one sometimes it's longer sometimes it's shorter now it's very different when you write 0.4 meter because if you write 0.4 meter the smallest digit here is that four so then it's plus minus of that one from that position which is 0.5 or 0.3 now 0.5 and 0.3 are much bigger difference to 0.4 compared to 0.427 uh, to 0.428 right so that means that if the line the same line is this line right here if I say that that's 0.4 meter that means that the difference between the measurement here is to that one the longer one is 0.5 and the shorter one is 0.3 so you can see that the difference between these three lines right here is much smaller compared to the difference between these three lines right here. So that means that this is more precise and that one is less precise. And again, precise here, as you can see, means that if I were to measure it again and again and again, there's going to be some difference, but the difference here is smaller, okay, if it's a more precise measurement. Now, what about if I say 0.42819667? Again, that means plus minus of the smallest digit. So that means it's plus minus 0.0. 
zero 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 one. So it's really tiny difference now. Okay. So if you look at the difference between these three lines, barely any difference because they're very close together. So again, that one would be even more precise compared to the other two. So this one would be most precise, medium, and then that's the least precise. Now all these digits that I've written down here, that's what's called the significant figures of the measurement. As you can see, the more significant figures you have, the more precise your measurement is. And that's what significant figures are, just the number of digits that you have in the measurement based on the instrument you use. Here I have the same exact solid copper that I'm putting in two different balances. When I put it on this balance, all I can see is 10.5 grams. When I put it on this balance, I can see 10.4978 grams. So which instrument is more precise? It's the right one. Why? Because there's a lot more digits right here and the difference between one measurement and another is 10.4978 plus minus 0 0.0001 whereas with this one it's 10.5 plus minus 0.1 so it's highlighted here the difference between those measurements okay last point to make here is how you read these instruments a lot of instruments uh, are digital which means that it just gives you a number and you can read it immediately but there's some instruments where you actually have to read it and then interpret the measurement by looking at the lines that are given in the instrument. So a, uh, a graduate cylinder, a burette, and so on are examples of these type of instruments. So the way you read this is as follows. You read all the digits that you can see just from the marks itself, and then you add one more digit, and that digit is called the uncertain digit. And that's basically your estimate of where the actual value of that measurement is. Okay, let me show you an example right here with this uh, graduate cylinder measurement. So remember that the way we read this is we read it at the lowest point of the liquid which is called the meniscus and the first thing we do is we try to figure out what is the value of these marks the easiest way to do that is I look at the numbers that are written here so there's 20 and there's 30 so if there are 10 marks between 20 and 30 what's the value of each mark subtract 20 from 30 which is 10 and then divide that by 10 and you get the value of each mark so each mark is 1 so that means that this is 20 this is 21 that's 22 23 24 and so on now the value value of this meniscus right here is exactly at 24. So then you say, okay, my volume is 24 milliliter. But wait, if you just say that, that means you're not giving an estimate of the uncertainty. And to give the estimate of the uncertainty, you have to add one more digit. So if you feel that it's exactly at that line, so it's 24, then you would say the uncertain digit here is zero. So you would say your volume is 24.0 milliliter. Okay. Now in your notes, you're going to have additional questions that you can practice on. So one of the things that you need to remember also from Chem 10 is how to count the number of significant figures you have. And the complication here has to do with when you have zeros in your numbers. So just keep in mind that zeros that are coming here at the back end are not significant and then zeros that are in between two non-zero numbers are gonna be significant. And then zeros that are coming afterwards at the end of the number are only significant if it is following a decimal point. If there's no decimal point, if the number is just say 4,500, then those zeros are what we call ambiguous and we would need to write that number in scientific notation in order for us to know whether zero is actually significant or not. The other thing to keep in mind is how we keep track of sig figs as we're doing some type of mathematical operation, whether it's multiplication, division, or addition and subtraction. Recall that for multiplication division, we would keep track of sig figs by making sure that our final answer has the same number of significant figures as the least precise measurement. In other words, the number of significant figures is the lowest that we see in all the measurements that we use. Uh, for addition subtraction, we're going to have to compare the number of digits beyond the decimal point and only write our answer that matches the measurement that has the least number of digits after the decimal point. So exact numbers are numbers that come about because we define a particular quantity. So for example, when we say one foot is equal to 12 inches, that's an exact number the definition of a foot is 12 inches because they're not measured then they are as precise as we can have them because they're defined as that quantity so in other words the way you think about exact numbers is that they have an infinite or an unlimited number of significant figures in other words exact numbers don't really affect 
your final sig fig calculations. Rounding off is another issue that we see a lot uh, of times with significant figures. Make sure that when you do a calculation that you do not round off at any point except for the last step in your calculation. So you might be doing a calculation where there's four or five different steps before you get to the final answer. So in any of those four or five steps, you don't do any kind of rounding. You just keep all the digits that you have and you do the rounding only at the very end, okay?